Hello, this is K1, and this is Kerbal Space Program. And this is Kerbal Odyssey, my continuing series on the history of human spaceflight, as well as some great what-ifs. In this case, what if we did not abandon Skylab? This is part three of this particular series. In the previous two parts, we had launched the Skylab space station, occupied it with the first crew via a... Apollo command service module and sent the first expansions to the station with the help of a Gemini expansion vehicle. I must point out that there was a slight error on my part in the last video. I referred to the launch vehicle as a Delta IV. It was actually the Titan 3C. I apologize for that. I do try and remain with authenticity here. But as we continue, our what-ifs include the actual what-if on the station involving a cooperative mission with the United States and Russia. One of the earliest versions of the cooperative mission was launching a Russian Soyuz to occupy Skylab. And we are going to do that today. I'm reducing the crew to one because I intend to launch a second Soyuz later to serve as a backup escape vehicle with a crew of two. So that way, the crew of three can return to Earth on any vehicle they choose. Now here we see the typical launch vehicle for a Soyuz spacecraft. This is the Russian R-7 launch vehicle. Let's make sure Skylab is in the proper position. It is not. If we're going to rendezvous, we need the station to be not on the other end of the planet. As it comes around in range here. And we will get this puppy in the air at nighttime. And here we go. Now I mentioned this is the Russian R7. This is the standard launch vehicle for any manned spacecraft dating all the way back to the very beginnings of the program. The Sputnik, the very first satellite, used the same basic launch stack as what they use for Soyuz. There have been some slight advancements in technology along the way, but overall it is the same basic design. And it operates under the design principle of why create large, complex engines? when you can just cluster many small ones together. In this case, each of these four clusters has four main engines and a couple of auxiliary directional engines, as well as another cluster of four down the central core. The originator of this design, or the primary originator of it, is Sergei Korolev, who was the leader of the Russian space program at the time. And he actually pioneered the idea of the multi-stage vehicle. Because until that point, all rockets were seen as a single, uh, single module with a single engine that just flies until its fuel is exhausted. Uh, but the most critical factor in any craft is weight. And we're going to separate as it is time for staging, leaving the central core to continue its journey. So as a spacecraft's primary concern is weight, how do we shed weight? Well, we just saw, we separate pieces of it. Postulated the idea, well, postulate isn't the right word, but proposed the idea of having so many engines and so many clusters that when their fuel is exhausted, they can be separated, thus reducing the overall mass of the vehicle and thus giving it less weight to push up. So less thrust is actually needed to get it where it needs to go. This is the basic idea of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. And of course, additional stages could be added on top of that if necessary, as we see here. The Spacecraft is hidden behind a shroud to protect it from atmospheric stresses with another rocket stage underneath it. Whereas the earlier versions of 
Sputnik. Sputnik, for example, only had the central core and the boosters. Let's see how close of a rendezvous we've got here. Um, moderate. There's going to have to be some correction in here, of course. But that's not too bad for a direct descent rendezvous. Well, it kind of is, but... Let's see if maybe I can trim that out. Ah, there we go. If I can get this on a direct ascent, that would be lovely. Now, a direct ascent rendezvous is pretty much what it sounds like. Um, going straight up from the ground to reach your target. So you can actually get it in the first try without having to wait for another orbit. Now we're going to be five kilometers apart. And we're going to have to dump that stage very soon. Yeah, we will. Sometimes it's not the greatest choice to do it that way, but I wanted to try it and see what would happen. But this launch stack had ended up being uh, so variable and so efficient that it has remained the pretty much the only launch vehicle for a manned craft that Russia has ever used. They've never really needed anything else. They used it for the first uh, Vostok spacecraft. Uh, there were six of them. They used it for the following Voskhod program, which only had two missions. And they used it for every Soyuz launch since. So much that is actually referred to as the Soyuz rocket. Let's go ahead and start trimming this out because we're going to lose that stage. Yep, there it goes. Separate that. Give those thrusters a quick fire. And wait until we're of a closer degree here. That should do it. Yep, there it is. And it might overshoot us just a bit. I'm going to disengage that shroud while we're at it. Yep, it flew past. That's okay. We can make that up. We're not too far away. Naturally, if this were any sort of real space mission, they would have the computers plotting the perfect trajectory. But here, we're sort of flying by the seat of our pants. And... That shift in the scene has revealed we are in fact in orbit. About another 20 meters per second, and we will have arrested our relative velocity. So straight up from the ground, from the ground, we've gotten a pretty good approach to the station. So, let's see if we can correct our angle. Now, I made a mistake that I don't normally make on a launch, and that is I still have my booster stage attached when I'm in orbit. Generally, I want to let it go early and let the planet's atmosphere bring it back down. Um, but when making a direct descent by the seat of your pants, sometimes you're not watching that. But that's okay. I could probably do something with that later. So, since I am within range, I'm going to dump that stage, since we don't need it anymore. And give a little boost to approach our station. Let's see what our rendezvous is looking like. Oh, that's pretty darn close. We're going to rendezvous on the night side, though. But I can adjust that as I move in. Now, you can't really see it, 
from this vantage point, but I'm going to go ahead and extend the modules here. The antenna and the solar panels. And the distinctive shape of the Soyuz. Now it's a little dark, so I don't know if you can see it, but what the Soyuz actually is, is a tri-modular design. Rather than one module for the crew and the service module behind it, it has three. The descent module, which is the part of the spacecraft that the crew occupy for launch and re-entry. The service module on the back, which contains the oxygen, electrical power, and propellant. But also an orbital module, which is a second pressurized module in which the crew can occupy while they're in orbit. Um, conduct their experiments, uh, basically have more room to move about, but it also doubles as an airlock. So they can depressurize the orbital module and leave the craft without depressurizing the main one. That is one of the many variable features that has made the Soyuz arguably the most efficient space, manned spacecraft we've ever devised. Um, the space shuttle, of course, can do more things than the Soyuz can, but the uh, shuttle is so big and heavy that the only thing it really can do is carry payloads to and from space, as well as uh, space laboratory modules that it can bring back down. The shuttle can only go so far, whereas the Soyuz was designed to go hand in hand with the Soviet lunar program. And they did in fact design a larger translunar module as well as a small one-man landing vehicle. The problem was that the launch stack for this, which would be the uh, N1, I believe, was incredibly more complex. I mean, it tried to follow the same principles as the R7, uh, smaller engines instead of larger ones, but there were so many. Let's kill this velocity while the station is getting close. Uh, the first, for example, the first stage of the N1 rocket is had about 30 engines and not including the second and third stages not a single n1 that was launched had ever succeeded every single one of them had uh, that had lifted off the pad had blown up before the first stage was even done So this obviously put a huge hamper on the lunar program for Russia, but the Soyuz spacecraft itself worked just fine. And it has served as the basis for space station expansion since the Soviet um, Salyut program. I'm sorry, that name got caught in my throat for a second. The Salyut, like Skylab, is a single module station and is of similar design. We will see Salyut in the next video, but for now, our primary objective is to bring Soyuz to Skylab. And hopefully we'll do so when the sun rises. It looks like we will. The first flights of Soyuz actually coincided with the first flights of Apollo. Uh, the first manned Soyuz, I believe, was even before Apollo 7, but it met with a similar fate as Apollo 1 in that its crew did not survive. A uh, difference being Soyuz 1 did actually reach space, where it faltered was on re-entry. The original mission of Soyuz 1 and 2, actually, was to rendezvous and dock in orbit, much like, Ge uh, much like Gemini had with um, the Gemini spacecraft and the Agena, but in this case it'd be two manned spacecraft docking for the first time. And that is one of the things the uh, Soyuz was designed for. But there were problems after launch with the solar panels and various other portions of the spacecraft to where it was not 
functioning properly, and there was a danger they would have to abort while in orbit. Now, they had actually considered sending up Soyuz 2 originally to a rendezvous and dock for a scientific mission, but since they already had it on the pad anyway, they were going to use it for a rescue mission. But unfortunately, there was a lightning storm, an electrical storm, on the pad a few days earlier, and it had fried the electronics. So there was no way they'd be able to launch. So Soyuz 1 had to abort and come back down to Earth as soon as possible. And this is where things took a turn for the worse, because in the development stages of Soyuz, in the late stages of it, they made a change, and that was to enlarge the heat shield, or make the heat shield thicker, which made the spacecraft far heavier, which meant the parachute that they had was no longer sufficient. They needed a larger parachute. Well, this was thinking ahead, having a larger parachute, but what they didn't think ahead was to enlarge the compartment that carried the chute. So they had to literally stuff the parachute in there, and we now get some light in the situation as the sun rises. Hello, Soyuz, and hello, Skylab. And I figured out how to turn the name target off. Now we can see it better. Um, so they had to like beat this parachute into the compartment with a hammer. So this presented the problem that once the parachute was needed after re-entry, and it was a successful re-entry by the way, uh, Soyuz 1 survived re-entry and returned to the atmosphere safely. But the parachute having been stuffed into this, into this compartment uh, could not unfurl properly and thus could not properly slow the spacecraft. Uh, Vladimir Komarov, the single pilot on the craft, decided to jettison the parachute that was deployed and deploy the reserve chute. Well, the reserve chute got snagged on part of the mechanism within the, the containment unit, and it didn't deploy either. So finally, in the end, the descent module smashed into the ground uh, far faster than was survivable. And this is why it is a good thing Soyuz 2 did not take off, because it had the same problem. It, did, it had the thicker heat shield, it had the larger parachutes stuffed agonizingly tight into its compartment, so it likely would have suffered the same fate. So the death of cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov was indeed a tragedy, but it could have been far worse. And the Soyuz ne necessitated a redesign to solve this problem. Now, there were, of course, other difficulties during the Soyuz program, um, but the following missions, Soyuz 3 through 9, 10 actually, had operated uh, sufficiently with regards to the safety of the crew, at least. This, of course, changed uh, for the flight of Soyuz 11. I believe that's 1972, around the same time of the final Apollo missions. Soyuz 11 had reached the Salyut 1 space station, and its crew had enjoyed a long stay aboard that station. In fact, they had become celebrities. Traditionally, the Russian space program had operated under a shroud of secrecy. Oh boy, that was too much thrust. Let's correct that. Um, and its secretive nature, generally when something important would happen, we'd only hear about it after it was successfully completed. And the Russian people, too. They were kept in the dark about as every bit as much as we were. Let's lock onto that docking module here. But after the world pretty much united after the successful lunar flight of Apollo 11, as well as the successful rescue from near disaster of Apollo 13, uh, the Russian government figured it was probably a better idea 
to bring their space program back, uh, out into the public light. And of course, it would they were suffering from some waning support. So it would have helped them in the matter of public opinion as well. And yes, indeed, the three cosmonauts in Soyuz 11 were celebrities all the way around. There was actually a Moscow television station devoted entirely to the crew. Not only coverage of the missions or the activities aboard the station, but for all sorts of things. There was a talk shows devoted to, to some of them, uh, specials regarding their lives and careers. It was actually amazing. I'm gonna turn this toward the sun so we can get a big gulp from its solar panels here. It's actually amazing how how much the public's appetite for the their cosmonauts was. Not surprising though, because Russia surely learns the importance of a vibrant space program with regards to public imagination. Unfortunately, when the craft were returning to Earth, a valve had not sealed, or actually it, it had burst open when the three modules separated and the atmosphere had vented out well, before they'd even entered the atmosphere. And all three men suffocated before reaching the surface. And since this was a media firestorm throughout the mission, they couldn't hide the fact that the cosmonauts were dead. And we had a nice steady docking. And we need to correct the angle of Skylab just a bit. Oops, fix it the other way. All right, let's lock in that trajectory. So it is unfortunate. All three men had not only lost their lives, but they did so in full public view. And this was devastating morale blow for the Soviet Union, but it was one of the last. Because after extensive redesigning and upgrades throughout the lives, uh, throughout the life of the Soyuz program, it had been flushed out into the most efficient space vehicle we have and still flies to this day. Taking that in for a moment, the Soyuz has flown successfully in, uh, successfully since 1973 and in varying degrees of success since 1967 or early 68. So it has outlived both Apollo and the space shuttle. And it continues to fly. And here we see a Soyuz docked with a hub module attached to Skylab. And this is about what it probably would have looked like if the Russian program coexisted with America with Skylab. Next program, we will expand on this station. And thank you all. This is K1. Thank you for joining me for Kerbal Odyssey. And we will see you next time.